So this video will be about the PhD project I am working on. It is based on a presentation I gave recently, but I added more details to make the context clear. So I will first discuss the general plans for my PhD project, the motivations for these plans, progress of my work so far, and finally, what I'm probably going to do next. So my project is part of the Working Package 6 of Center for Intelligence Electricity Distribution. This working package focuses specifically on the transition pathways and strategies of the distribution grid. Previously in Working Package 6, driving forces at different scales that would be crucial to the transition of the distribution grid had been identified. CNLD had also developed 133 mini-scenarios, which describe segments of potential pathways. These pathway segments were projected onto four quadrants constructed from two axes, the end-user axis and the grid axis. For example, in mini-scenario number one, high grid ranks causes many end-users to adopt batteries and distributed VRE which in return leads to higher grid rent for the end users who still draw electricity from the grid, and therefore creates a positive feedback that encourages more end users to adopt self-consumption via batteries and distributed VRE. So this mini-scenario is describing a potential attractor within the fourth quadrant, trapping the transition process if we ever get too near to it. What I plan to do in the PhD project is to model the transition of the distribution grid as a dynamic system based on the aforementioned driving forces and mini-scenarios. The key concept will be to define a set of technical, economical, and social parameters, and try different combinations of values of these parameters when running the dynamic system. Each combination describes a specific scenario and the result of each scenario defines a specific pathway. If we run enough amount of plausible scenarios, we will get an envelope of pathways based on which we can set long-term strategies. So for a concrete example, if we assume that DSOs remain highly skeptical and are not exposed to sufficient pressure to change, they will act conservatively in the next decades and do not take into account new flexibility resources in their planning and operation. Meanwhile, it is possible that batteries and solar PV become so cheap that a large amount of end users still instill them, and we end up arriving at the situation described it in mini scenario 1. The exact opposite can also occur. We can envision a future where DSOs are more active in adopting new technologies while end-users do not actively participate on the grid. So the transition on the distribution grid is mainly around the automation and digitalization of technologies within the power system. And of course, it can also be the case that both the DSOs and the end-users actively innovate themselves, leading to the most desirable future. In my PhD project, I plan to focus on the analysis of three concepts during the transition of distribution grid. Active end users, optimal DSO planning, and unexpected disrupted events. Now the reason why active end users and optimal DSO planning should be studied is pretty straightforward. They correspond to each of the two axes of the pathway projections we just showed. But what about unexpected disrupted events? What am I referring to? If we look into the last decade, we can see various examples of unexpected disrupted events. The Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011, the Fridays for Future in 2018 and 19, and the ongoing Russia invasion in Ukraine right now, to name a few. While none of these events could have been taken into account in the transition model in advance, once they occurred, they changed drastically the pathway of energy transition. So the key concept here is that an unexpected disrupted event represents a sudden change in parameters or driving forces, such that a scenario transits into another. 
A concrete example would be the following. Suppose climate change induced extreme weather causes the DSOs to be more conservative, while technology in other sectors still advance. Without other disturbance, we should end up in the fourth quadrant. However, if another disruptive wave of global climate awareness or geopolitical conflicts accumulate sufficient momentum such that political pressure is enough to force DSOs to change, we may still be able to land on the first quadrant. In the transition model, an unexpected disrupted event can be exogenous parameters or driving forces change, such as a financial crisis or endogenous dynamics within the model, such as a cassette failure of the power system. It can of course be both. So if a war or a climate tipping point occur, there will be parameters change in the scenario, but there will also be an increased probability of cassette failure in the system, and the components in the power system may also behave differently in the failure. So I am actually at the very beginning of my project, and I am trying to find a method to model the physical layer such as the default electricity demand, the power network, and power plants. Since we are investigating the distribution grid on a nationwide scale, we need to find a balance between accurate representation of reality and acceptable complexity within the model. To achieve this balance, I look back to my undergraduate days when studying computational fluid dynamics. In CFD, there are three scales of modeling the fluid. On one extreme, for the microscopic scale, you model the particle feature of the fluid to learn finance detail and let molecules collide with each other. On the other extreme, for the macroscopic scale, you completely ignore the particle feature within the fluid and just discretize the Navier-Stokes equation. Now, in between these two extremes, in the meso scale, we have Lattes-Boltzmann method, which preserves some of the particle features of the fluid by distribution functions, while also avoid costly computations of particle-to-particle -particle interactions at the finest level. If we apply the same concept on electricity demand, it is easy to see what the microscopic scale would be. We model electricity demand of each and every person, friend, or other irreducible agent within the population. The other extreme, at the macroscopic scale, is also easy to see. We neglect all the individual heterogeneity and model only the electricity demand of entire sectors, i.e. the residential, the commercial, and the industrial sector. But what is the mesoscale modeling in this case then? I would say that it is to model the electricity demand profile of different sectors as spatial temporal distribution field. So basically, we represent the demand of the population at a point in space with some probability distribution that can be described with a few parameters, such as mean, variance, or distribution type, thereby decreasing the degree of freedom needed in the model while still preserve some form of heterogeneity throughout and within each point in space. You can see the preliminary result of this mesoscopic approach using open-source electricity demand data from ENTSOE and Bayesian maximum entropy inference. Now I infer the electricity demand field based on population density, which would be reasonable for discrete electricity appliance and electric vehicles. But for heating demand, flow area will serve as a better choice for information input. I also have not yet decomposed the electricity demand into different sectors and commercial and industrial electricity demand might also need other more appropriate information input for inference. Okay, but this part is like basic geostatistic, and we know that people doing energy analysis of buildings also do this type of spatial temporal analysis very often. What will be new in my PhD project is that in the model, the inferred electricity field will be coupled with a power network model and that the aggregated behavior of end users according to the electricity demand field will interact with the operational framework on and between the distribution and transmission levels. But how exactly are we going to do that? 
So once again, I go back to my undergraduate days and see if there exist similar problems in other fields of science. And sure, there are. For example, in hydrology, sometimes you need to model the interaction between rivers and groundwater level. What you would do then is first identify catchments that are hydrologically independent to each other. Then you study the interactions between the rivers and the groundwater level within the catchment one at a time. How is this interaction between rivers and the groundwater level modeled? So for the river, you have a mass conservation equation that takes into account evaporation, runoff, human activity, and groundwater intake. This equation will tell you the river level. Meanwhile, you also have Darcy Law and the resulting Poisson equation for groundwater level modeling over the entire catchment. The river level and the groundwater level are then coupled by the rate of intake of groundwater into the river. In power networks, we also have a similar multi-scale interaction framework between the transmission and the distribution network. On one hand, the transmission network can be modeled using the ordinary power flow equations. On the other hand, we can isolate each distribution network and model the power flow within the distribution grid by treating voltage on the grid as a spatial temporal field and thereby arriving with a power flow equation involving fractional Laplacian. The two scales of models interact with each other via the power flowing between the transmission and distribution network at the nodes representing the primary substations. So what will be the next steps? Well, currently we are still trying to polish the physical modeling part of the distribution network. We are also working on the behavior and operational strategies of end users and other distributed resources. We are also working on the market and grid model DSOs and TSOs we'll be using at the operation time scale. Of course, ultimately, what we are interested in is the investment and behavioral change of all the relevant agents and the accompanied macroscopic social transition, which will be addressed next. And then there will also be circular dependencies between the two timescales. So for example, allowing active end users participated in the flexibility markets on the transmission level might increase the value of rooftop solar and batteries on the operational timescale, thereby accelerate their uptake on the transition timescale and force other agents to align with this trend, which in return change the operation of the energy system later on.